So Ed, how are you feeling today? How do I feel? Today. With my fingers. I thought so. <laughs> People were telling me that. <laughs> do, you, do you remember the name of your grandfather? <clears throat> My, my grandfather and my grandpa, my grandmother got married. But what were their names? Do you remember their names? Henry Risley and Laura Risley. Okay. How about they? When they got married, she got, got preg pregnant. After a while, then went to the doctor. And the doctor said, Laura, you should have never married Harry. He'll be dead in six months. Oh, well, Harry lived to be 76 years old, and he had 12 kids. <laughs> Were you the youngest or the oldest or in the middle? My mother was the oldest, and she took care of pretty well. When she got up a little bit, pretty well took care of the babies. And my grandmother used to work out in the garden, truck patch, and he used to raise stuff to take to the market in Baltimore. And one time, Grandpa, was, he told me, one time he took a load of hay down to the hay shed when they had horses in Baltimore. And uh, when he come back between halfway to Ellicott City and Catonsville, there was a hotel there, and it had delivery station and all, and he stopped there overnight. So old guy come in the saloon, and the bartender says, Joe, I bet you can swallow one of them goldfish and keep it down. Bet you $5. And Joe says, that ain't nothing. So he throws $5 up on the counter there, and he gets a goldfish and swallows the goldfish. And, and the bartender says, you're the third guy that swallowed that goldfish, and up she come. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Grandpa and them used to do, raise all kinds of stuff. What? Had, had to, all kinds of stuff to go to the market. What kind of stuff? Had, they made butter, and they had a little butter thing, had a pound on it, but it had a shock of wheat on it. I can remember putting a butter in there and pushing the thing down for a pound of butter. What else did they take the market in? Oh, they butchered hogs and all kinds of rhubarb and all kinds of grow, stuff that grew in the garden and all. Well, name some of those items. Blueberries and blackberries and and uh, and they had an orchard. They took apples. I had them old York apples and wine saps and old them old time apples. You don't see no more of them anymore. Where was his farm? On Tridelphia Road. How many acres? 96. Who was farming it besides him? Did he have helpers? No. He, he pretty well run it all by himself, except when they had thrashing time and thrash wheat and everything. One time, they always, all these men followed the thrash machine from one farm to the other. And mostly, they didn't need all the help when they started trashing out the barn. Didn't take nowhere near that much help. So, but the, they would always give them their breakfast. So one time, they got up in the mow. All these guys got up in the mow. My grandpa come in the barns, and he says, "Come down, men, come down." A whole bunch of men come down. He said, "He give them some names, and he knew some of them, so he let them go back up." Then one guy. One guy come down and he says, what's your name? He says, too good. He says, you might be too damn good. I don't need you. <laughs> so. <laughs> about what time, what years was, are you talking about now? What years? I, oh, that, that was before I was born, all this. I was born 19, May the 20th, 1923. And, uh, I, I was a $15 baby. Let's go back to your, da your granddad and your dad. Your, so your, who had the farm first? Your granddad and then your dad? Can you remember that? Who had the farm for my granddad? 
Oh, well, when he got married, he lived in the house where my mother was born. And I was born in the same house on Triadelphia Road. So your granddad had... Wait, let's go. Okay, so now your dad took over the farm after your granddad passed away? My dad, no, he never got the farm. My father never got the farm. What, did you, what was your father doing then? When he, when, before you were born, what was your father doing? What was his business? Oh, he run a trash machine and sawmills. He made shingle mills and, and made shingles on a shingle mill. Where did they get delivered? They moved from one farm to the other. My grandpa, Frank, John Frank, he uh, moved all over the country with sawmills. He, 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 sometimes if he's going to be there a long time, they'd build a, what they called a shanty. Had it, uh, take, and, take boards and make a chimney out of it and everything for to have a warm, stay in there all winter. So he was going to somebody's land, cutting down the trees? Yeah, he cut down the trees, and the farmers done, done they did that. All he done was the sawing and the shingle mill and stuff. So then they'd all be put on a what? How would they be transported? They'd drag them into the, the sawmill with horses. No, no wagons at first? No what? Wagons? No, they just drug them on the ground. To the sawmill? Yeah, and then and sometimes he'd buy a track of timber, and he saw it cross size for there being no railroad. So some of the timber went to the railroad. Did some of the timber go to people making homes? Did did people buy the timber to use to make their houses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Besides the trains. He. And he's also this. My father used to haul stones out from the Marysville Quarry behind his steam engine. He had two wagons behind there, and he used to haul them out the Marysville Road to, to uh, Route 40 was a national highway when he was building it. And they dumped some here and somewhere from the 16 mile house, 17, 18, 18 mile house. And he, and he, pulled this here lever on the wagon and he dropped out. And if it was big stones, he beat them up with big sledgehammers. And if it was his little, smaller stones, it had a little hammer with a long handle on it and he put your foot on it and, and crushed the stones out. Did your father's sawmill, was it, all, was it one place or did, could he move it around? No, he moved it all around. He didn't, he didn't ever set in one place. Did he do any sawing for any like amusement parks or anything? Yeah, Glen Oak amusement parks. My grandpa, my father saw it all that out. The, the mountain, mountain Speedway and all them buildings out for that. And Glen Oak Park was in Woodlawn. Yeah. And he he moved the mill from wherever the job was to. Yeah. Over. What? How would you describe your grandfather? Describe him. Yeah, like was he a good man? He was, he was a short guy, little short English guy, and he never weighed much over 100 pounds. And my grandmother was a big German woman, but she was big, but she wasn't fat enough, and she had big, big bones. She was just this big. How did your grandfather treat you? That was his what? How did he treat you? Was he nice to you? Oh, yeah, he was real nice to me. He'd tell me all these kind of stories. I like to sit around and listen to him. And my, my father had a, a, a George Fleming work with my father on a sawmill, off burn and foreign engine, steam engine. And, and when I was a little old kid, he used to get the, uh, the sun paper and read Uncle Wiggly. She was in there to me when I was a little teeny kid by kerosene lamps. He was a nice old fella. And uh, when, when uh, my father, 19, my father, we got in and raised and stuff for to go to the 
Baltimore and everything too. We raised strawberries and blackberries and, and uh, chickens. We put out, in uh, eggs, we put out about uh, 300 baby chicks to get 1,500 land hens. Ain't nobody eat as much back chickens as I eat. My mother used to take them, split them down the middle, open them up, and dress them and all, and put the whole little chicken in the pan there and fry it. When they gave us about the size of a pigeon, a squab, man, you talk about nice and sunny and sunny, you could go, it almost sucked the meat off the bones. <laughs> Do you remember about how old you were when your grandfather passed away? He passed away before I died. You were born. B born, rather. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're still here with us. <laughs> At least you look that way. <laughs> Say that again, what happened? To your, what happened to your grandfather? He did what? I gotta get it without the break. My grandfather had a lot of sheep and I used to go there. What did, when, your grandfather passed away when? He must about 1922, because he passed away this before I was born. Great. All right, so <clears throat> did you have two grandfathers? Two grands, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, your mother had a father. Your father had a father. That means two grandfathers. Yeah. Which, we've been talking about your dad's father, or have we been but talking the, about your mom's well, father? The, the one that had the sawmills was my father's father, my grandpa. John Wesley Frank. And did you know your mother's father? Yeah, yeah, I did know him for years. What was his name? Henry Ridgely. Okay. So what was Henry Ridgely doing when you were little? What, what was, was his business? He, he was in the, he was he run the farm and all. And where was the farm? Huh? Where was Henry's? On Tridelphia Road. Okay. It was only about a quarter of a mile away from where my mother was born in the house where I was born. Do you remember how many acres it was then? Yeah, it was 96 acres. Okay, we got two different grandfathers here. We got to try to separate them, right? Yeah, we have, I'm not sure we defined the mother. Okay. What's your mother's first name? Edna. <laughs> Edna's father's first name? Henry. Did Henry have a farm? Yeah, 96 acres. So then... So how many acres did your, your, your father's father have? He never owned no ground. He was doing something different. Okay. He, he rented. He, 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 my, my grandmother on my father's side lived in Baltimore. He rented to move around different places. Okay. What, do you have any idea how much land he rented when he was working the land? What was that? How much land did he rent when he was renting? Was he renting 10 acres, 100 acres? Do you remember how much he was renting? No, he, he only owned a farm or 96 acres. Was anybody... Oh, they did rent my, my, when my uncle took the farm over. He, he rented a lot of ground around there close. I, I, I sent corn for him for, for 50 cents a day when I was a little kid. Nine, 10 years old. How much were you getting an hour? 50 cents, 50 cents a day. A day? I might, I might work six hours or eight hours or something. I was only nine years old. He couldn't pay me very much. Right, he, so he, a man was only getting a dollar and a half a day then. So when you got your 50 cents, did you save it up? Yeah. I started saving it up. 
For what? My uncle Washington Lincoln Ridgely. He he was come along. I don't know what where he come along in the family, but anyway. He says, you want to do something for me? I says, yeah, Uncle Wash. He says, I'm going to give you some guinea pigs. But he says, don't pick them up with their tails. Well, he gave me the guinea pigs, and I kept looking at him and looking at them. I says, they haven't got no tails. So he was, they, he was raising them for John Hopkins Hospital, and he was experimenting with them. And he gave me 15 cents a piece for him. So my aunt used to bring stuff, come out on the Greyhound bus, and at the end of Tridelphia Road, she, we didn't have no telephone. She sent us a letter telling us about when she's going to be there. And I'd take my little red wagon and go up and load the stuff on her. She was a nurse in Baltimore. Load the stuff on a little red wagon and take it down home. So she, she, every time I'd do that, she'd give me a silver dollar. Well, I must have had about seven or eight silver dollars or maybe a few more. And my father, he was Savings Bank, Savings Bank of Baltimore, was in Baltimore. And my father talked me into putting these here silver dollars in the bank. And we was getting a two and a half percent interest when the Depression was. So... I thought I'd, all I'd have to do was go down and get my silver dollars back, and most of them was 1923 in accordance to when I was born. So, but to come to find out, I couldn't get them back. Well, that kind of floored me there because I wasn't going to get my same silver dollars back. <laughs> so, I'd done all kinds of different things and trap for trapped fur bearing animals and stuff and sold their hides and foxes and raccoons and possums and skunks. They smell real good, them skunks. And uh, they was good perfume. If you got a cold, you had some of that stuff in a bottle and you sniffed a little bit, it opened, it was good for it to open you know, the not stuff in your head and all up it open and all that stuff and you spit up all that old stuff. So you were working on the farm as a little kid. Were you going to school then too? Were you going to school? Oh, I started to start when I was six years old. I started to school on a, a Model T Ford school bus. Where and did you go to school? West Friendship, West Friendship School. The guy that owned the school bus was Ross Upper. He was the first contract contractor for the Howard County Schools. That was when he first had the buses. And his old buddy, when he needed another bus on, he left it. his old buddy, uh, Ollie Miles, had the second contract, and Frank, Frank Floor got the third contract. And old Mr. Hooper, I rode on his school buses. I worked on his school buses. I drove on his school buses, and he always said he wanted to be 90 years old. And he missed it but one day. And, and uh, he was a nice fella, but he got drunk when he was 12 years old. And he said, yeah, I'll never get drunk again. But you know you can smell alcohol on his breath. Him and Ollie Miles were those drinking buddies, and they drove them school buses and you could smell alcohol on it. He'd nip every day. Today, they got David. They wouldn't let them drive no school buses. <laughs> what, what do you remember, Ed, about your your father? I doubt if it was your grandfather remembering electricity. We had uh, the electric come out to to West Friendship. How old were you? I was I was twenty. I guess 20, three, four years old. And my father paid the gas electric to run the electric line down to his house and had to pay him for the two poles and run it into his house. And later on, when it went down the road, they gave him his money back plus interest. 
you know, for what he had paid in the first place. And when he came back to the farm, where did it come from? He come off of 144. Well, it was 19, it was Road 40. Or Frederick. Na National Pike. How come, how come they got electricity? You know why they decided to do that? They were doing just fine with their farm without electricity. Why did they decide to get electricity? Well, it was a whole lot better. We had an old gray cook stove. Had an old gray cook stove. We didn't have much money. We didn't have much, a whole lot of clothes. We always had plenty to eat. Had a big garden and butchered some hogs and, and all kinds of stuff. And my father used to haul eggs in the Balmer for the Purity Creamy Company. And he sold them like 20 cases of eggs a week. And uh, before that, we used to take them around the stores, Ellicott City, all them stores, I.H. Taylor and Ellicott City and all them places down there and sell them the eggs and all. But then he quit that and he went to sell them all in, at one place. When you first got electricity into the house, what, what did that do? Oh, that lit the whole world up, man. Did you? Lit the whole world. We yeah. had out, lights in every room. We didn't have to carry one lamp from one room to the other or light a lamp or nothing. How about the refrigerator or the radio? Oh, we had an ice box. Uh, Oil and Ice Company was in Ellicott City. It was just across the bridge and, and uh, where the high store is now. And he'd come around and he'd sell ice. We had this here sign up. If you wanted a five cent block, you put the five cents up the top. If you wanted 10 cents, you put 10 cent up the block. He'd chip it off. He big, was in big chunks. He'd chip it off and bring it in and put it in the ice box. So what happened to the ice box when you got electricity? Well, I guess we, I don't remember, I don't remember setting it outside, but I don't, I guess he jumped it, I guess. <laughs> Did you ever chop the ice up in the ice house? What's that? Did you ever get the ice out of the ice house, the ice house yourself? Did you? Did you take the ice back to the house yourself, or did somebody else take the ice back to the house? He, he bring the, brought the ice all around. Took it all around through the country, all up, all up Glen Elm, all around. Do you remember how he kept it in, in his wagon from he, 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 At first, uh, he had a wagon, and then he had a Model T Ford truck. Had a sign on the side, Arlen's Ice Company, Ellicott City, Maryland. Ice was cold, wasn't it? What? I said ice was cold, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. We used to get a chick, get the ice pick and get a tree chunk of it and suck on it. Good put it ice. in ice tea. Well, before they did that, my mother had a store. My grandpa had a big pond, and it it'd freeze over, and we still got all the stuff that he cut the ice with and tongs and all. And he took it, and, and, and he had an ice house, which was probably about 14, 15 feet deep. And he'd put the ice in there and put straw on it and put ice in it and put straw on it and filled it all up the top. Well, it lasted way up in the summer, in, 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 in the ground out of the way. So when, when did you no longer, or your grandpa put it in the ground, you had it delivered from Ellicott City? Yeah. My grandpa used to have a lot of uh, sheep. Well, I told you that. Yeah, I used to turn that sheep shears with him for him. Do you remember making ice cream with the ice? Oh, man, we made ice cream all the time. If it was strawberry time, we had strawberry. We, mostly we had vanilla ice cream. Then when it was strawberry time, we had strawberry ice cream. And... Uh, Raspberry. Peach ice cream, we make peach ice cream. Boy, was that good. We had a, free, uh, a thing, it made, it made about a gallon and a half at a time. Put it in there and you turn it and turn it and turn it and, and uh, freeze this ice cream. Did you have your own cows for milk? No, 
I used to walk down to my grandpaps, and he'd have cans of five and seven gallon cans in the cooler, and I'd just take the dipper and fill a gallon jug up. 25 cents. I, I, I didn't stir it up. I got most all cream. <laughs> <laughs> now what do uh, your grandfather and perhaps your dad w w how did they get water well let me let me get into something else here before we get to that Go ahead. My, my grandpa's house burnt down the chimney caught on fire and it burnt the house down so my, he heard that my father had a sawmill. My father was living in Marysville then, in a log cabin in Marysville. And uh, he heard that my, my father had this sawmill, so he got in touch with him to come to, to his house there and sawed it out on Tridelphi Road there. So he sawed the house all out. Then when my father met his oldest daughter, Edna was my, turned out to be my mother. That's where he met her. And he, he, he got married her, and when he got married, he bought a brand new Chevrolet, $490, and he, and he went to, to New York City on a honeymoon. And as far as I know, he didn't have no flat tires. I never heard nothing about that. You couldn't get very many miles out of them tars if it's a rough road. And one other time, I can, when I was a little old boy, he he had a case trash machine, and uh, he needed some parts for it, and and and. Uh, uh, so my Uncle Charlie had this Chevrolet touring car, and uh, we went up to Harrisburg. He had three flat tires. He had some extra tires with him and all. We started that early in the morning. When he got back home that night, it was dark. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you even today know how to patch an inner tube, huh? Oh, yeah, we patched inner tubes and all that stuff. All right, so let's, talk, let's think about more memories between the time you were born <clears throat> on the farm and the time you were 20. During that time, you were going to school, <clears throat> and you were, I guess, coming home and working on the farm? What, what was it like then? Well, when I pretty well started going to, going, going to school, he, and all the chestnut trees got the blight, so that there, he didn't saw no more shingles because that there put put that shingle business out of out of business, and and uh, he was still starting the sawmill some, but not a whole lot, because stuff got built up pretty well, and uh, so he. Uh, did your did your mom while your dad while your while the sawing was going on was your mom growing any food around the house around the property was your mom growing did she grow anything yeah she was tend to raising us kids she's a day at home, stay at home mom is what to call them a day but was she growing any vegetables yeah she run a truck patch and all kinds of stuff we had all kinds of stuff to eat so she had a garden. Yeah, I had a garden, big garden. And, and, and when the strawberry time, all the cousins and all come out from in Baltimore, and the, the, the kids would walk all through the strawberries. If one strawberry had a little bit of pink on it, they'd eat them. And they mashed all the strawberries up. So my father, he kind of got wise, so he didn't plant no strawberries for a couple years. Because they, you know, come out there and walk all over them. And them, them city kids come to the country, they go, wow. They run all over the place. They was into everything. And, and one of them was Billy. He's a big old chunky boy. 
And they had these here big sausage hot dogs. And old Billy, he, uh, he must have ate about eight or ten of them. And this is off records now. When he, when he got older, he got diabetes and he lost his leg. So he went, I went to the hospital to see him. And he says, I always remember Uncle Eddie had them big old hot dogs. He says, I know that I ate eight of them. <laughs> so finally end up, I had to get his other leg taken off. He didn't last long after that. Now, let's see now. When I started school, I went to West Friendship School. Then, it went seven years there. Then, I went to Lisbon school, and I went four years there, and one of my te teachers there, she says, Ed, you so thin, don't you get enough to eat? I said, sure, I get plenty to eat. So she had the typing class in school. So I had a little trouble with the typewriter, so I went and worked on it, and, and so Every year, they'd have a guy come there to clean the typewriters all up and everything before the school started. So about the middle of the year, he got to have a little trouble with them, and I got to work on them and everything, get the harp carbon tat, clean the, the letters all up on them, put new ribbons on them and all. For four years, they didn't, the guy never come there. Well, who taught you to work on a typewriter? Come in my head, man. I'm a mechanic. I got a mechanic brain. Yeah, but when you were working on typewriters, how old were you? <laughs> then I uh, was see, that's 34. 1934, when I got out of West Friendship. Uh, 11 years old or something. So I, I guess the, the school did have electricity, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. West Friendship School had electricity. But they had a big furnace down in the ball in the basement and they had a big pile of thing in there where they brought all this coal in. And they used to fire it on Mr. Amos had a little store right there next to school and he sold uh, soft drinks and, and the candies and stuff like that and and to the school kids. And some of the kids in, when I was in the elementary school used to ride the horses to school. If he was in a Further than a mile from school, he could ride the school bus. But this one boy had a lane almost as a mile long, and, but his lane was only was less than a mile from the school, so he had to walk two miles almost to get to school. And where was this? The West Friendship. Oh, where he lived? Down on the... Thompson Drive, back into their world and the houses are now. He was clean across the the dual highway when it come out to her. What did you like about school? Did you have a favorite subject in school? What did you like about school? Did you have a favorite subject? Man, I, I stayed at West Friendship two extra years. I was in the first grade two years and the second grade two years. I, I didn't want to go to school. I didn't see no, no sense of going to school, to tell you the truth. Well, when, you, when you went to school, what was your favorite subject? No, I'm getting to that. So, I got in the third grade. And some of you didn't know, her name was B. Streaker. My father used to thrash for them with the steam engine. And of course, he didn't want to blow the whistle on the steam engine because the horses would run away. So when he'd get done in the evening, he let her blow the whistle and ring the bell. So she kind of took liking to me and had all these timetables and cards, you know, two times two and four times four and all. Man, I'm telling you one thing, I was really good on that arithmetic. I could even count pennies to get up to a dollar. So that's when you got your first silver dollar. She, 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 uh. Now, what was your least favorite subject? 
You like I history? liked history. Good Lord, I'm telling you, if I'd have been there at the Boston Tea Party, I wouldn't have unloaded that there, unloaded that tea. I'd have sunk that ship. Especially if it was an English ship. Now, in the Revolutionary War, I had people who was on the English side and people who was on the American side. So English was? And general Burgoyne was a general up, up in Massachusetts. And the, the Blue Mountain Boys defeated him up there in the Revolutionary War. That's how I come to name, name my brother Burgoyne after him. So you were, you were also a history whiz in addition to arithmetic. You like both history and arithmetic. Yeah, yeah. Now what did what did you do for recess or lunchtime? Oh my! Oh, you getting down now now? We had to, two recesses. We had to, one recess, and then we had lunchtime and another recess. So we uh, one time we was playing ball, and, and uh, this streaker boy was pitching. And Lester Bloom, he hits the ball over in the field, and it was high grass there, and he was hunting for the ball. And Lester, Warren took the, the golf ball out of his pocket and threw it into Lester, and Lester hit the golf ball, and he come back and hit Warren right in the tooth there and knocked his front tooth out. And Miss Shell was a principal. She took him over to Sykesville, to the dentist, and the dentist put some goo in there, but it, it never was satisfactory. It never stayed in there. And we're going to explore life after you were 20. Did you go, I, I didn't ask you, uh, uh, did you go to high school? Yeah. What did you do in high school? Well, one of the main things I did in elementary school was put the flag up and take it down. Let's talk. Then I got in high school the last two years, I got the same job. I put the flag up and put it down. And guess what? I, when they tore the old high school down, I got the flagpole. And I'm going to put the flagpole here at the museum when they get the big building done. No, I'm going to donate the flagpole from there from the class of 1942. Do you remember in high school? whether you were helping your dad during the day or at night or on the weekends? Were you helping him? Oh yeah, run the trash machine. I started off with him on the trash machine when I was six years old. Down on the Folly Quarter Farm down there, which is a state farm now, I met a boy down there, Charles Beaver. And we all went to school together and we graduated school together. And, and uh, we are always good friends. We, we got to always have a, a class reunion every couple of years. Now we have it every year. But Charles, he died. And uh, Betty Jane, we, he, they went to school together. He married a, his school girl, married a school girl he went to school with. Did you... So here's this big thrashing machine. Was this, this, how did you get a big thrashing machine? What, why did you get one? Well, my grandpa, on my father's side, he saw me old and thrashed. And I had one uncle that thrashed and saw me old. And I had another uncle that saw me old. And my, one uncle, he got to be farming on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And he come around the curve and either he was too late or the other one was too early or something. And he come around the curve, he didn't get to the side track. They both hit together and knocked the, train, the engine off the track and he, he steam killed him. And uh, my other uncle on my father's side, he... Uh, he uh, was a sawmill man. He went all over the country and, and uh, 
But him and my other uncle was hobos. They'd drive, jump on the train at Marrittsville and go all over the country. And sometime my grandmother never heard nothing from him for a couple years. And she always said she worried about him so much because she never heard nothing from him. And uh, my uncle Harry, he had a great big sawmill on the Arkansas River. And he, he done sawed the stuff out, and made the floor, and kiln dried it, had to put it in there and dried it out, and then made the floor and everything. He had a real good operation. And the Arkansas River got up one time and washed everything away. So that was when he was, he quit sawing. When did it, so, Ed, tell me your earliest memory of the first thrashing machine. Who had the first thrashing machine? My great grandpapa had the thrash machine. He had an old wooden thrash machine. What was it like? What was it like? Describe it. Well, when he, he had steam engine run his, it was dusty. Dusty and dirty. But, but this same thrashing machine didn't get passed down from one generation to the other. Did you have different? No, no, no. They bought different thrash machines as they got better. So, wood, and then they went to metal. Yeah, my father jumped the wood. We still got parts of it laying around home now, the, the wooden one, case thrasher. Do you remember all the models all the way back to your grandfather? I don't know. I, 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 I see them in books and, and things and pictures of them. So just to help us. See, what we used to do when we was down on the state farm, we blow this, we thrashed down there for a whole week. And we'd blow the straw and stuff, straw out in a pile. And we'd pull up a little bit, blow it against there, and we'd have this real long straw rick. Then we'd go back later on in the fall, or later on in the summer when it's pretty well done thrashing, bail the straw up. In little, you know, case bailer. Did they cover the straw up from the rain, or just it didn't get wet underneath? Well, they had barracks, what they call barracks. So they put out some of them and put them out in the field, and they put it out in the field, and they used to put the hay in it loose, and then they put the straw in there, and then they sell it, and then they got so guys come around buy the straw right from the thrasher. So we on our thrash machine. In 1938, we fixed it up so we run the, uh, we sold a steam engine and got this 1926 cross motor case to run the, the thrash machine. And then we hooked the thrash machine and the baler together and thrash and bailed at the same time. When he, th when he threw out the straw, describe what these barracks were. What's that? You said that the straw and the hay were in barracks. Well, it's just like a barn only. It was a big, they, they wouldn't have no cattle place or nothing. They I mean, just kept straw and hay and stuff in them. It was like a cover. Yeah, it was a, this is a building, just like a barn. Did it have sides on it? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it had open so it, you could drive right through. And there's a mow here and a mow on each side. And then when you went there to bail or to trash, if they put the hay, put the straw, put the wheat, bundles of wheat in there, you could try put them in both sides. Did it have doors? Some of them had doors, but most of them didn't have no doors. Most of the farmers, a lot of them would put the wagon in that in the middle part of it, the wagon shed. And they had corn houses, was the same way, corn here and corn here, and open in the middle, so they'd put the wagon stuff in there. And when, when uh, my grandpa, in about 1918 or something like that, my uncle told him, told me he bought an international grinder that ground corn, wheat, and stuff. So, 
you put the a grinder up in the granary up on the top, and my Uncle Bill would get up in there and put the grain in there, and, and it would come down in the chute, and the chute had two bags on it. And my brother and I, we was, we was seven or eight years old, we'd get down there and bag off. We'd push it over this way to put it in this bag, and then when we got that full, we'd put it over that bag, and him and I would tug it and pull it off to the side a little bit. And I got that feed grinder, that feed grinder I ground feed with for the show. I got that. But I never was able to get that engine. And the way I heard when my uncle moved away from around here, my Uncle Bill told me that they let the junk man have it. I tried to buy it from him for a couple times. But I should have never trusted him anyway because he told me them our guinea pigs had it. If you pick them up with a the tail, it's going to, the eyes are going to drop. <laughs> so the, the earliest thrasher machine that you remember that you worked on was, can you describe that thrashing machine, the, the very, very earliest one you worked on? What was that machine like, the thrasher machine? It was all steel machine, the case. Case thrash machine, Racine, Wisconsin. That was an all metal machine. Well, my father, the father, the biggest one that my father had, he run it with steam engine. It was a real big, big thrash machine and the 50 horsepower steam engine. So the guys talked him into getting this here 1926 cross motor case was only was only uh, 45 horsepower. So the guy says, that'll pull that big trash machine. You won't have no trouble with it. But he wouldn't pull it. You couldn't, you couldn't throw the weed in it like you, you got the baby, had the baby along. So my father was about to buy a Frick trash machine from the Frick Company up in Pennsylvania. So he's, the case man found out he was in market for another steam, for another trash machine. So when Father says, if you raise that deck up eight or ten inches higher than what it is in that low deck thrasher, they called it the low deck thrasher, that case bill, that didn't last too many years. He says it don't shake the grain out, how much grain goes out in straw. So he said, if you raise that up eight or ten inches, I'll buy another case. So the guy that was in the fall of the year, and he told him, he says, you hold, hold off here. Yeah, till spring, and I'll have you one of them trash machines. So he got the trash, first one to come off the assembly line. And we still got it. It's home in the shed. Still got that old tractor and the baler and everything. What did you do on that machine? What did I do? Yeah. I tend to the blower that blow the straw at the windstacker, to the straw ricks, and then when you got trash and baling, I, Throw the block and poke the wires around. And Donald Ridgely, he tied the wires. When you went out thrashing, that lasted a long time? Oh, yeah, it lasted all through the summer. When they first started going out thrashing, they used to put the wheat in the barn or the barrack. But the weevil got so bad. The weevil didn't start in it till it got until he got for about uh, August, we, Weevil got in it. And then Weevil dust would get all over you and you scratch an itch. And these colored boys used to go home and take a bath in the kerosene. Keep from getting the itch from the Weevil. You'd get whelps all over you if you itched it. You'd get big whelps all over you. Did you? Did you get any welts all over you? Did I get any? Yeah. No, I didn't have no trouble with them. I, do, I just wouldn't scratch them. Good for you. One time I got the poison oak and, and it got all over my face and everything. And I had one of them, uh, I had a hat was tight on my head. My head was, my head was out that far past my hat. Where it had held it in up the top. And I could hardly see. And the old guy told me, he said, if you eat a poison oak, 
If you eat one of them poison oak leaves, you never get the poison oak no more. Well, I told him I was kind of jubilant about that. Damn, I didn't, want, I didn't want to get that inside of me. But see, I was raised on homeopathic medicine. My grandmother on the Frank's side and my father, grandpa, was raised in home, Humphreys homeopathic medicine. They take a little bit of of a uh, little bit of different things and mix it up in sugar and water and, and you take these pills. So my brother, when my brother was five years old, he got polio. And the doctor said, Mr. Frank, you just well take this boy home because he's going to die. He says, there ain't nothing we can do for him. He says, we can't, we tried to break his fever and he don't know the medicine we got, don't do nothing for him. So my father took and got this Humphreys medicine, they were little sugar pills. I they took them all my life and I still take them. They were little sugar pills, but they put a little bit of this here, uh, poison ivy leaf in it and ground it all up, mixing them with sugar and water. So my father, when he got the pill that was for fevers. He'd mix it up in a glass and, and about every 15, 20 minutes he'd give him a little spoonful of it. In two or three days his, his uh, fever broke and he lived to be 78 years old. Sir, I think you believe in homeopathic medicine, don't you? Well, polio is the same thing. They give you polio to, to stop you from getting polio. But see, it don't make no money out of that. That, that ain't no money in that. These, all these duck pills they give you today, they all kill you. All right, well, while we're still You don't want me to get into that, do you? The pharmacy people be on me. <laughs> That's for later. <laughs> Ed, you just finished a... You just finished thrashing a farm that hired you and your dad and the thrasher. And now how does the thrasher get from one farm to the next farm? Well, in 1940, my father got leg. He'd been having trouble with his leg. So he went to the doctor down to Ellicott City and he says, Mr. Frank, go home and put hot towels on it. About three days later, his level D was that big. Called the doctor up, and the doctor done, went away on his vacation. And the doctor come, and he says, you got to get that guy to the hospital right away. So, uh, took him to, it, it was on my birthday. And we, I had plowed the garden, and a big thunderstorm come up and washed right down through the middle of the garden. Washed all that stuff out the solid ground <laughs> right in the hall. And the amylands come there. Higginbottoms come there. Had a blue Christ amylands. Took him down to the, uh, the uh, 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 let's see what, uh, University of Maryland. And that, about that time, penicillin and sulfur drug come along. So they told, when they told my father, he says, you got osteomyelitis of the bone. My father says, cut it off. And my father, he studies the medicine. He says, cut it off. No, we're going to save it. I'd go down there to visit him. Man, you, could, you couldn't stay in the room. His leg was rotten. And he kept telling him to cut it off. He cut it off. If he cut it off, he cut it off right there. But no, he got up the boat here and he cut it off. Well, it was a little boat along in there and he cut it off. So they all sewed it all back up real nice looking and all, but it wouldn't heal. Little place about as big as my thumb kept weeping. So they x-rayed it again and says, we've got to take more of it off. Father says, take it off. He says, take it off up in the hip if you want. No, but he says, we'll save you about a four-inch stump and you can ride artificial leg. 
So my brother and I and my Uncle Andrew run the trash machine that, that summer. I tended to run the trash machine, and my sister, oldest sister, she tended to make the bills out. And I never was much for going out and collect money for the people, and anybody owed me, and I'm the same way to this day. I ain't much for asking people going after them, you know, to collect money. So this is one old, one old farmer. My father come out to try after he got his leg. He was in the hospital practice all summer. After he got his leg healed all up, and it went to this one farmer. He had a date set for what he wanted to farm, trash. So I, I lost a day and a half thrashing on account of him. So, you know, waiting for him to thrash. So when I went up there with the bill, I took my father along with me. And uh, I gave him the bill, and he says, can't you knock a little off of that? My father says, you talk to that boy there. I says, Mr. Will, you offered me extra money if I'd come up there at a certain time, but I said, I didn't charge you that extra money. I charged you, uh, I think it was six cents a bushel thrashing, just like I charged everybody else. My father, he was, he, my father was, everybody was the same. He never cut the price for nobody. I didn't care how much he had to do. He was all the same. He treated everybody the same. And, uh, if I said it was 280 bushels on that meter and I told him that's what was on that ticket, my father was honest. He, he didn't mistreat nobody. One guy come in the garage one time and says, I beat him. I said, man, he ain't going to say that about me. I said, you work for my father and you couldn't say that about my father. You ain't saying that for me. I'll give all your money back for the job. Well, that go, that, that's off records. Okay, so who made the decision for the time to thrash? In other words, we know that the wheat or the rye or the oat or the grain has to be a certain... Who made the decision when it's time to thrash? Yeah. Well, when the, when the wheat got golden and yellow and the farmer would go out there and take a grain, put it in his mouth, if he could bounce it, chew down on it, it was real soft, it ain't, you don't want to thrash it yet. Or cut it with the binder. When you, if you cut it then, the grain all shrivels up. If you cut it too green, so they do that and they put shock it up out in the field, leave it set there for at least a week or two. Then, for, if there's any weeds or anything in it, dry out. Then you trash it. What if it rained? What if it rained? They capped them. They take a bottle and bend it down over the top of what they call capsule. Cap it and then that, all the water run off around the sides. Now we have, did have years that it rained. We, we stayed in one place for, for four weeks. And it rained practically every day. And, and uh, the Wheat shocks on top would all sprout and come all up and everything. And a, a whole lot of it, they just sowed the top parts away and leave it set there. When the sun come out, the others died off and you, and you thrashed it. When we took it down to the, uh, the place down in the Ellicott City where he sold it, he docked you on all that there stuff because on a lot of that stuff wasn't real good. Well, you, so you, you've got it all loaded. Not only did you load it and save it in the thrasher, could you also, on the farm, dump it and then load it into a wagon? And so you would have the thrasher with, the, with it and the wagon with it and maybe even two or three wagons if it's a big farm. Is, is that correct what I'm describing? Oh, they had... Well, the, gra the grain went into bags at the thrashing machine, right? Yeah. They put in bags there, yeah. yeah the but they part. had horses and wagons that hauled it into the thrash machine. 
And then the thrashing machine thrashed it and put it in the bags. Yeah, yeah. And where did you take the bags? And it took them, put them on the truck, and took them down to Ellic City to the, to the uh, uh, donut. The uh, Donut Corporation. Yeah, the donut. It wasn't donut then, but it was. It was. Well, it was I guess it was donut then, though. Well, just before that, it was the yeah. Mexico flouring. Company. Yeah, yeah, it was just a flour mill. And they took all the grains from fields, or just one kind of grain? Oh, we thrashed barley, wheat, rye, buckwheat. What, it, what did the mill take? Did they take took, all those grains? No, 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 they just took wheat, flour. Now, one thing we haven't squared away yet, when the, when the farmers planted the wheat, they all didn't plant at the same time, so it all didn't get ripe at the same time. How did you schedule the thrashing machine? Did you do them in a row down the, down the highway, or did you have well, to Well, sometimes that had something to do with the condition of the ground. Some, some places, now, up to her father's up there, of course, he used a lot of fertilizer because he was a fertilizer. He sold, they sold fertilizer. Her uncle was salesman for fertilizer, so they used a lot of fertilizer. And, and his wheat generally got was first. We tried for him first. Because it was ripe first? Yeah. But then, so therefore, you didn't do one farm after the other going down the road. Well, Mr. William, we, right here at West Friendship, Mr. William Risley, his wheat got, was kind of got earlier than a lot of it. But we'll be done. We thrashed barley first. Made a big circle all around. Clean down Cumbia. Halfway to Ellicott City, cleaned the Woodstock. Then they used the barley for the feed the cattle and all, and they didn't ship selling sell none of it nowhere. And then we got into the wheat, and we'd done the same thing, went around to the wheat and went down there to the feed and to the mill down to Elk City. How about telling us the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat? Well, see, we. Out west, when my great great grandpa was out west, they planted spring wheat. Around here, we planted winter wheat. Well, tell us why. I don't know. I guess it maybe it's just a habit. I don't know. <laughs> no, because out west, and was open fields and all, and probably the wheat would freeze out through the winter. Where around here it's not as cold, and the wheat just lays matted over the ground. But out there, probably the reason why they planted spring wheat was on account of the cold weather and all, the weather conditions. Yeah, and, and in contrast, it's kind of strange that when you plant wheat in the fall, called winter wheat, you were, you were grateful to have a snow fall on the wheat because that kept it at 32 degrees, whereas if it was zero or minus 10 or something, you might ruin the whole crop. Well, so we were thankful for snow. No, around here, if it was late planting the wheat, a whole lot of it would freeze out. It's got to get matted over the ground. If it don't get matted over the ground good, it, some of it will freeze out. And I'm actually somebody planting spring wheat out west. So farmers here did plant it in the in the fall, and, and those those crops came in before anybody planted the spring wheat, right? Yeah. So that's why it was kind of a whole summer job of getting wheat because the farmers didn't always plant See, it. See, when they was planting the wheat out there, the wheat probably was about that tall around here if it was going to get up like that. And they was just planting out there. Soon as the frost went and left. Yeah, we were talking about how it's done in Howard County. Yeah, right in Howard County. Was, and we also planted winter wheat, and some farmers planted spring wheat. Then, then they got uh, oats. Oats, they got so, it was a winter oat and a, and a, and a spring oat.
terms you break it down so you can measure before it runs out. Oh, All right. So, Ed, you were <clears throat> you spent one summer, Ed, running the thrasher yourself. Did you have helpers, though? I had my uncle. Okay. See, the farmers thrashed. Farmers furnished all the help. Oh. We didn't. We didn't have enough to do with that. You just drive up with the machine. We had uh, well, all we had was the guys that worked right on the thrash machine. The engineer was on the tractor, and the guy bailing and tying the wires. And it, could you run all that yourself? We used to have three men on there, and after six years old, my father and I and my brother. I took a, a, a job away from the man when I was six years old. What job? Tend to the windstacker on there when the straw come out to, out to the straw rig. You were getting paid for this or were you just a happy volunteer? What's that? You were getting paid for this? Were you a paid thrasher operator? I, when, when my father was in the hospital, I was the whole operator and everything. No, but what I meant was, was your dad paying you money? Did what? Was your dad paying you money to help him when you were running and operating the thrasher with him? Did you get money for that? Did I get paid? Man, back in there. Back in them times, I was lucky to have clothes and stuff to eat, not knowing getting paid. What happened to your 50 cents a day when you were little? I thrashed, I husted corn. Okay. For my uncle, for three cents a shock. My brother and I. So it was down to three shocks. So we get up early in the morning, about daylight, to try to get these three, so we'd hit this other. So, my uncle, he would put two or three extra rows in the damn shop. <laughs> he put two or three extra rows in the shop. I have to beat that out. And he made the shop bigger, see? And everybody else, you get three cents a shock, but you, you shocking the, you hustling for him by the shock and a quarter. Well, who did the counting of the shocks? Who counted them? They was all my uncle counting them. He knew how many was in the road, and we shot husk them. So my brother and I goes over there early that morning. Here comes Mr. Joe Selby. Mr. Joe Selby had four or five little sons, and he gets on that row, and he was finished that row before we was finished the three and four shocks. And my uncle gave him three cents a shock for little teeny shocks. I'm watching that. Okay. You made the math, that's what I mean. You know what it's going 27 minutes off. That's 12 or 7. Thank you. Well, but, but how much is that in a day then? If it's three cents a shock, how much did you make in a day? Did you ever figure that out? <sighs> we could eat about seven or eight shocks we'd make. It was enough, and we just well stayed home. Okay. <laughs> did you ever to, did you ever go to your dad and say, "Look, Dad, I want to get paid for this"? What's that? Did you ever go to your dad on the thrashing jobs and say, "Dad, I want to get paid for this"? When the Second World War come along, I promised my father. And I was going to stick with him until I was 21. So I stayed with him all the time. I got married in 1949. And in 1950, he gave me $250. I told him I didn't want no money because I was making my own way. And he gave me $250. I took him and my mother and my little boy Eddie and my wife 
on a trip all up in Canada. Oh, Detroit, went all around Detroit, went across over in Canada and come back right down all through Maine. And uh, one of the things I can really remember about that Maine, we was up in Maine and we got this motel. And the woman around the motel says, if you want some cold water, ice cold water, says go up there and give my, tell my daughter to get to put some ice in a pitcher and water. So when I opened the door, this perfume, she must have had a date or something was going to go out with somebody. And this perfume like to hit me and knock me over. So I get the water and takes it back to the house. And evidently she had that perfume on her hands. I took it in the, in the room, motel room. And my father says, what's that smell? Now I give, like that was a picture. And I said, she had perfume on her hands. And I said, throw it out. So the next morning I got up, we turned the radio on, and it was about three miles where we back from where the motel was, back where we had come through that day. A deer hit a car, these the fellow and his wife, girl, they just got married, they was on their honeymoon, and a deer hit and killed both of them. And I remember that about that trip. Then my father wanted to pay me something from then on, I said, he says, your wife's going to get mad at me. I said, she ain't going to get mad at you. She knows what the story is. So, when, when you were a teenager, did your dad ever say anything or insinuate that you're getting your room and board instead of being paid? Never, never did that. I run a little garage over there. I, didn't, I, I paid for the telephone. And he paid for the electric, which wasn't nothing to run a little garage when I first started out in 1942. What is this thing you're calling the little garage? What do you mean by the little garage? A little two-car garage, home garage. And why did you have a two-car home garage? <laughs> we did. We used to have a great big building there. We put the thrash machines and everything in it. And, and the building caught a fire. We had a 34 Chevrolet in there. And my brother and I and another guy, we was about, uh, uh, about a tenth of a mile away from home when it caught on fire. And the fire engine come up our old Charlie Klein, come up in Ellicott City with the fire engine. And time, for the time they got there, it was all burnt down and everything anyway. So he, uh, we kind of figured he had a bunch of old windows. And the back of the building was that high off the ground and it had some straw in there. And he kind of figured that the light shining through that straw was a real hot, sunshiny day in the summer that it might have... That's because it started in the back of the garage because the guys, some of the guys in our neighborhood come push the 34 out. Okay, Ed, you were talking about a two-car garage. Was that the one at your home where you live now, or was that? No, that was over across the road where I was born, over my father's. Okay, so now I'm, I'm a tad mixed up. You were born over your father's across the road, so then... I moved across the road, built the garage there. When you were what age? What, what's that? What age were you when you did that, roughly? I must have been about 29. Okay. How did you get the money to buy the place across the road? I trapped. Worked around for the farmers. Worked on automobiles when I was home. Drove a school bus. And you thrashed wheat. <laughs> and you were still thrashing wheat too? Did what? You were still thrashing wheat as well? Yeah, 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 I was thrashing wheat and all. Okay. But I didn't make no money out of that. Oh. So the other jobs help you save. 
and you got yourself a place across the street for how much money did you get it in those days? How much money did I pay for it? I ain't going to tell you that. Okay. <laughs> no. I made up my mind when the depression was, my father owed, owned, owed everybody. He owed mortgage on the house. He, he uh, uh, owed money for the banks where he borrowed. And one thing I remember about Banks when he borrowed, when the person was, and I was a little old boy, he went over to Sykesville Bank, and, and a Brown was the president of the bank, Brown, Brown was the president of the bank. <clears throat> My father went in there and borrowed $100. Oh. So Mr. Brown went back in the back there a little while and he come back out and he says, Mr. Frank, I can't lend you no hundred dollars. It ain't worth nothing. And I just couldn't understand that because every time my father got a check from trash and stuff, he took it to the bank and come out with money. That was kind of hard for me to understand being a little kid. And he wasn't worth nothing. But along the line somewhere, <laughs> He did borrow some money from them. Then when the banks all closed that time, but my father, he, he, uh, he, he paid, my father paid what he owed the bank. He wasn't like a lot of these other people. He didn't pay at all. But the case company wanted their money for the, 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 the dealer, what we bought the case stuff from, the trasher and the mailer and stuff. He went bankrupt. So the case company come to us, so they had to get the sheriff to come out to levy on the stuff. And the sh sheriff knowed my father for years, practically grew up together. And the case, two case guys was there, and I was there. And the, and the sheriff says, let me tell you before we get started here. See, my father paid at the end of the season. He didn't pay so much a month, and they wanted so much a month. Well, we didn't have no money in between thrashing and, and, and then only for the chickens and the eggs and stuff, and that was very, not much to that. So the sheriff told him, and says, Mr. Frank's an honest man. And he says, if you're going to sell this stuff at public auction, he says, you ain't going to get half of what he owes on it. He says, you better take the way he wants to do it. He says he'll pay you. And when they'd come around every once in a while, want to make him pay something, and he'd give them 2 or $3 or something what he afford. So I made up my mind then that I ain't never going to go in debt. I, so I, then when I got a little bit older, I said, I'm going to be worth at least $3,000 before I get married. Well, I give $1,100 for the piece of ground. All the logs, the trees on it to the sawmill, got them all sawed out, built a house, and it's, it's oak. I mean, it's oak. It's hard to drive a nail in an oak board when it gets, when it gets dry, seasoned. So, when I got married, with, I was right around $3,000. And I told Mr. Mercer wanted to sell me the corner for my house, clean to the corner, for $5,000. I gave him $1,100 for the ground I bought, three and six tenths acres. That's the only time I'm going to, one other time I admitted I was a fool. I should have bought that corner. You know, tell us, Ed, how uh, you made arrangements with the bank to, to borrow money, let's say, to plant a crop or fertilizer or anything else, and then you, you only paid it back after the, the week. No, the we didn't. We didn't that, that wasn't the way this worked. We didn't buy no fertilizer or nothing. We just bought the equipment. Didn't have to borrow for the seed? We didn't plant no seed. 
mean, farmers some, planted seed. Well, some farmers did. You, I guess, I guess, like I was saying that the farmers borrowed it and then they paid it back after the crops came in. I mean, I know you didn't do that, but you, you know how other farmers. Yeah, that, that's the way. Some when they sold the wheat, they go to pay the bills they owe to the bank. To the bank or the seed man or whoever they got the seed and stuff from. Or the case dealer. Yeah. So you got this place across the street from your father. From whose? You were you bought the piece of No, no, for Mr. Mercer. Mr. Mercer. He owned it, but you were across the street from who? Who's, who's bought, on the other side of the street from you? I, I bought the cross the road from my father. That's what I said. Your father is across the street, and you're on the other side of the street to your father. Rose right across the road. And you started what kind of business then? I was in the garage business when I got when I went there. And, and tell me the kinds of things you fixed. What did you fix? Well, I overhauled a Model A Ford in 1940 for a guy who worked on the sawmill for my father. For twenty-three dollars. Why, why? Why didn't he go out and buy a new car instead? No, he, the, the car didn't belong to his father. You said you said it belonged to a guy that worked for my father. I was saying, how come the guy didn't buy it? Okay, what I'm trying to get at is this. It was up to you. It sounds like at the time it was up to you to keep all the different kinds of equipment working for the people around you. Yeah, yeah, I repaired all kinds of tractors and everything, done welding. When, when I got out of school, I worked on a lot of watches and clocks. Okay. Watches and clocks, so I wanted to be a watch repairman. So I goes down Balmer down to Jenkins, it's the people that sold us the class rings for graduation classes. And he wanted to give me seven dollars for a six day week. And I says, man, I can't run down here for that. That was 17 miles away. One way. So I've been working on cars and everything, so I just kind of drifted into that. Kept working on them. Did you see much farm equipment? Were you able to help the farm? See, see what made my business. All these people that we thrashed for, I got all them customers. I never had to advertise enough. No, I, did, I never was much for advertising. I never got tied up with anybody selling stuff. I just all did repair work. So were you able to repair the thrashing equipment? All kinds. I've done welding and everything. What, what typically was a problem with thrashing equipment? What needed, what was the most repair? You would always have to do one of these on thrashing. What was that? Well, when my father had other people working for him, they wouldn't half grease the stuff. You'd have to oil it and grease it, and they wouldn't half do nothing. And every few years, he's putting on new boxings and bearings in it. Well, my brother and I, when we got a grease in it, we greased everything. Grease is the cheapest thing you can get when you got equipment. Did you have a, a moving repair vehicle? Was everything done at your shop? I, everything was done at the shop. I'd go on the road and get them started and stuff like that and tow them and everything. At one time, I had all the towing from home clean up to Lisbon. And then the state police, a guy I went to school with called me up, or she went to school with called me up, and then the state police says, Ed, you want that towing? And I says, yeah, Eddie, yeah, I'd like to keep it. He says, well, it's going to cost you $5 a car. I says, them troopers, Charlie Klein was paying them $5 to get all the towing, see? And he says, well, if you want the towing, you're going to have to pay $5. I says, Eddie, I says, if you ain't making enough money, why don't you get another job? I says, you ought to have better sense than to ask me 
that we went to church and Sunday school together to do something like that was wasn't right. I says, that ain't right. So then guess what? I didn't do no time for any of the people I knew. So it was a wreck back the road for me on Trialdelphia Road one morning about 7 o'clock. So my brother, he was worked at Westley House then, so he stopped over there and says, there's a wreck down. He says, Tommy just went down the road and there's a wreck down the road. So I went, took the car and went down there. But you didn't take the tow truck. So took my, uh, uh, so went down there and the police uh, the boy's father stopped up the garage and told her to bring the tow truck down for me to tow the car. I gets down there and old Smitty was a state trooper. I, so the boy's father says, I want him to tow that car. It was an argument. He wanted to know whether I had insurance and everything. I says, don't you worry about what, what, what I, my stuff is. You worry about your job. I said, I'm towing that car. So the other guy lived right down the road from me. He knew me, and I worked on his car. Well, he wanted me to tow it up there. Well, Smith says, you ain't towing either one of them. So, Ed, did you ever work on tractors? Tractors? Tractors. Yeah, I worked on tractors. That old, that old 26... Uh, Case tractor we used to run a thrash machine for. We got all the parts. He's going to put uh, new burns, new burns and sleeves and rings and valves and stuff in it. We got all the parts, but in the middle of the winter, the guy up the wood barn was going to do it. He worked on them tractors. So he kept putting my father off, putting my father off, putting my father off. I said, Papa's getting awful close there if he gets to something done on that tractor. And so he says, what do you think we ought to do? I says, tear it down. Tore it down. Put it all back together. And I didn't like the looks of the rings it was putting in it, but the case people made them. Put it in it, and the darn thing used so much oil he fouled the spark plugs up. We was thrashing at one place. I had to go down Charlie Klein's to get another set of plugs in it, so we thrashed. I had to put non flowers on the spark plugs and raise them up so they wouldn't foul out. Run that thing all summer. Used it all. The guy was coming there with the Robinson Oil Company. He was coming there bringing 30 barrels of oil every once in a while. Man, that thing just drank oil. So I got the old rings. And the boy that I grew up with down on the state farm, he worked at down American Hammer, Charles Beaver. And I went down there and I said, Charlie, can you see you get them and make me set of rings up for this thing? And I showed I took the old rings. I said, if it's a four cylinder, I want you to take these rings and make them like these rings here. Man, he put them in there and then run that thing. The guy, oil guy goes, how come you ain't buying the oil? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you could make a ring. Yeah. I, I can make rings out of stuff, but you got to have a certain kind of... It's, see, it's a sleeve. They make it like a sleeve. Like it's three inches. Well, they pour this sleeve... Maybe it's a, inside it's inch and seven eighths. So say you put it in a mold. Yeah, they mold it first. It's just like a piece of pipe. You take a piece of pipe around, cut it off. You turn the outside out to where it fits in the cylinder part in there, the water jacket and all. And then you bore the inside out to fit to the piston. What makes of tractors did you work on? Fortunes. Fortunes tractors. Any other kinds? Fortunes. I've worked on John Deere's case, Alice Chalmers. 
There ought to be two or three more different kinds there. Yeah, the red ones. Like farm <laughs> International farm homes. That, she got sick and didn't come to... She couldn't teach, so the principal took over. And we was making these paper airplanes. <laughs> and and math, he gave me these math things, and I'd go up there and figure them out. He says, Ed, you're not doing it right. I says, well, give me another one. And I'd do it my way, and I'd get the same answer. He says, well, you ain't doing it right. I says, well, I get the right answer. So he so he says, go sit down. So I sat down, and the boys are making these paper airplanes. So Leonard Mornix, he was sitting beside me. Leonard was sitting beside me. And I made this paper airplane. Leonard says, let her go. And, I, and Mr. Mr. Dawson was on the blackboard writing something, and he hit it right in the middle of the back. Who threw that paper airplane? I put my hand up, Ed. I want to see you after class. I said, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble now, I guess. So goes her. <laughs> he says, why did you sell that paper airplane? I says, Leonard told me to do it. Leonard told you to do it. I says, you know that big coal furnace we got there in the basement there where it heats the school? If Leonard tells you to stick your head in there, you're going to go down there and do it? I says, No. He says, let me tell you, the good Lord give you a mind of your own. And he says, you ought, don't always listen to somebody what somebody tells you. He said, the good Lord tells you, with, with your mind, you'll know what to do. 